So you've got a booming town rapidly becoming the world's first industrial city but you've also got a problem because now you've got tons and tons of raw materials heading into the city from the hills and valleys beyond uh, coal and iron and that type of thing and you've also got tons and tons of materials leaving the city cotton and felt this is a problem well if your town is Manchester and you're living in the middle of the 18th century then you've not really got a choice all you've got is a system of poor quality roads and even poorer quality pack horse routes which are not very nice for the poor animals but they're also incredibly slow and inefficient for your goods so what do you do hmm? well I'll tell you anyway because I can't hear you you take a long hard look at your water Boats were an obvious answer. They could carry many times more weight than a horse and cart in a fraction of the time and a fraction of the price. In the 16th and 17th centuries, more than 20 rivers in the country had been made navigable for boats, including the Aire and Calder just across the Pennines from Manchester. Here, long cuts avoided tricky bits of river altogether and encouraged canal builders to do more, to make canals straighter and more artificial. Now as the city's only sizeable river, the River Irwell really was the only option and they did end up building the city's first waterfront over there uh, at the end of what became known as Key Street. Now trade had been going up and down here for years but it wasn't until 1736 when Edward Byron built the first proper quay here at the bottom of Key Street and the River Irwell and the River Mersey were made more navigable further downstream that uh, trade really took off on the river. Um, and they were using those uh, flats boats, what became known as flat boats, um, famous down the, the River Mersey. Um, very shallow boats in the water but with large sails. Now this picture shows the new quay and in it you can see a small warehouse with a Mersey flat sailing boat. So called because it could navigate very shallow waters. So why didn't this become Manchester's port then? Well sadly the route was still slow. Um, and depended largely on favourable weather. Not only that, but you had to dredge rivers in shallow sections and avoid them when they flooded. Not only that, but anything upstream of here is unnavigable to large boats, so you've still not solved the problem of how to get lots of raw materials into the city from the hills. So, your problem remains, how do you feed the city and get all the products out to market quick enough to keep this mad wheel spinning faster and faster? Well, there's not much you can actually do. It's not like you can dig a massive trench, fill it with water and let your boats run up and down it with all your goods, can you? Well, you can, and they did. Now, canals weren't new ideas exactly. In fact, they were several centuries old already, originating probably in China or even ancient Persia. But in the modern era, they were unheard of. Except, crucially, the Canal du Midi in the southwest of France, built in 1681 to connect the Atlantic Ocean with the Mediterranean Sea via the River Garonne. With its tunnels and aqueducts, the Midi was a great success and an engineering wonder of its age. Over towards Warrington, the construction of the Sankey Canal in 1757 was the first purely artificial canal running alongside the Sankey Brook and allowing coal to be transported from St Helens to the River Mersey. However, it's still not often thought of as the first pure canal of the industrial era because it follows a natural water course. So the credit for actually being the first goes to this one. This is the Bridgewater Canal built in 1761 uh, by the Duke of Bridgewater, Francis Edgerton. Having inherited the title of Duke at the age of just 12, Edgerton grew up with incredible wealth and vast trappings of land. But unlike most aristocrats, he was also savvy and proactive. And as the Industrial Revolution unfolded in Britain, there were those who were able to take great advantage of their wealth by investing in booming industries and those that didn't. Edgerton was the farmer. Uh, his estate included lands here in Worsley, uh, where there was great seams of coal producing an impressive amount for market. Now Edgerton could see that the demand for coal was only going to increase with time, and so he realised that the best way of getting his coal to the market in Manchester was by water. So he and his land agent, John Gilbert, discussed the transportation problem and a problem of drainage in his mines. Gilbert then brought in a man by the name of James Brindley, 
an engineer who had helped to create an extensive drainage system at the wet earth colliery in the Irwell Valley. Together, Gilbert and Brindley designed the Bridgewater Canal. Now it's funny because when I think of canals, I think of black and white days um, of like old narrowboats pulling coal and stuff like that. Or I think of being a kid and going for nice bike rides and having a lovely day out, you know. But I don't think of it as any sort of technological breakthrough because um, it's lovely. It's absolutely beautiful and people love canals in Britain. But it's not that impressive. There's nothing massively engineering impressively about it. But back in the day, the idea of carving a massive channel through the, the woods and the fields to get to where you wanted to go and sending boat after boat after boat down there, that's cutting edge technology. Pardon the pun. <laughs> but imagine how exciting that would have been. Um, it's just incredible. Now I've always wanted to come down here to this little enclosed spot in Worsley which is why I've got <laughs> I've got up at the crack of dawn to come down here before anybody sees me. Um, so this is Worsley Delft and as you can see it's just a little Delft branching off the main canal down there through that tunnel um, and this is where all the Duke's coal came from. Um, just through this tunnel here, this is the original tunnel and this goes for miles. Look at that absolute miles and miles of tunnels under there under this cliff <laughs> goes for for ages just coal seams all over the place john gilbert saw that it was possible to connect the canal directly to the mines by the way of an underground canal not only that but it helped with the drainage of the mines and provide a source of water for the main canal so this used to be an old sandstone quarry uh, but john gilbert saw that this would be an ideal place for all the Duke's coal to come out from the mines um, and hit the quarry down there. And as you can see, there's plenty enough room on the water here for small boats, these old starvation of boats as they were called, to come out um, and take the coal. Um, so much so, it was so busy here that there was a million tons of coal at one point um, coming out of these mines here. So they had to build a second tunnel, which is this one down here, um, and that meets the first one about 500 meters underground. Around 47 miles of underground canals were constructed on four different levels, connected by a water-powered inclined plane and lifts. The main tunnels stretched as far north as Farnsworth, with side tunnels running off at right angles along the coal seams. Each year, as demand went up, the mines stretched deeper and deeper into the seams. Specially designed boats were used in the tunnels, given the name Starvationers because of their narrow shape and what looked like protruding ribs. These were loaded with coal at the coal face and brought the coal out onto the canal where they could be transferred and moved off. So the reason the Bridgewater Canal is the historic one is because it's different to ones like the Sankey Canal which follow natural watercourses. This one doesn't follow any natural watercourse. In fact, it crosses the River Irwell here at Barton. Um, now this behind me is the famous Barton Swing Aqueduct. Um, and it's kind of another <laughs> on the greatest hits tour of the canals of Britain along with Worsley Dell. Um, and this swings out of the way to let ocean going vessels up and down the Manchester Ship Canal, which is what the River Irwell here became. Uh, but before this, uh, before this swing aqueduct was built, was a stone aqueduct which James Brindley uh, constructed. Now that was 
a, a feat of engineering in itself because it was the first time that a canal had gone over a river um, in Britain uh, in the industrial age and it was a, a watershed moment. Elsewhere, the canal followed natural contours of the land rather than digging tunnels and deep embankments, meaning that digging was kept to a minimum. There were no tunnels or locks, and apart from an aqueduct, the whole route was one simple, uninterrupted route into the city. Brindley even suggested that they reject the more direct route, which would take the canal into Salford, and swing south instead. Why? because this would allow a more open run into the city and also allow more connections to any new canals that would be built, which is exactly what happened. Within just a year of opening, the Bridgewater Canal reduced the cost of coal in Manchester by around two thirds. It was then expanded in 1776 all the way to the River Mersey at Runcorn, and then from Worsley to Lee in 1819. Its success encouraged other wealthy industrialists to build more canals up and down the country, this was the golden age of canals in Britain, an era often called canal mania. Around Manchester there appeared the Ashton Canal, with its minor branches of the Fairbottom Branch Canal, the Hollingwood Branch Canal and the Stockport Branch Canal. The Manchester Bolton and Bury Canal, the Rochdale Canal, the Peak Forest Canal, the Huddersfield Narrow, the Leeds Liverpool Canal and the Macclesfield Canal. So the Rochdale Canal was the only one that cut through the city centre. Um, you can see it behind me, it cuts right through the red sandstone bluff uh, upon which the Roman fort sits. The Roman fort is back there behind the viaduct. Um, now this is Castlefield. Uh, the Rochdale Canal goes under here and meets the Bridgewater Canal which terminated here um, and formed a brand new canal basin, uh, a brand new transport hub for Manchester um, and a new centre for the new obsession of the city, warehouses. Now one of the earliest surviving warehouses is this one behind me with the twin arches there. That is the grocer's warehouse and it was built in the 1770s. Um, unfortunately, it was knocked down in the 1960s after some idiot on the council decided it wasn't worth anything. Um, only to be partially rebuilt in the 1980s um, when somebody realized it was actually quite a valuable uh, asset. So another early warehouse um, was a, the Duke's Warehouse and that was on the other side of Chester Road, on the other side of this bridge here, uh, where that brick apartment building is now. That burnt down in a fire in 1919, I think it was. Uh, anyway, as you can see, the canal is down here, um, and as is the River Irwell as well. But the city itself is up there, um, and that height difference is quite significant. But what better way to overcome that in places like the grocer's warehouse than with a load of hoists uh, and water power. So the grocer's uh, warehouse is quite an interesting one uh, to look at and I like that it's still kind of here. Um, as you can see there's two inlets, there's one there and one here. And the boats would have come straight in with the goods. Uh, there were several levels as well uh, where the goods could be taken to and sorted and stored because uh, it was a warehouse. Um, and they were taken off the boats using a pulley system right at the back down there. Um, like a lift, it would have just winched it up to whatever floor you needed to go on, um, which was powered by water. Now this is the clever bit. You see that gate down there, they'd open that gate 
and down, I don't know if you can see down there in the dark recess, there would have been a, a water wheel which would have powered the whole system, the whole pulley system. So simple but clever. These types of split level water powered warehouses were already in use on the Irwell and their design solved a real problem almost unique to Manchester at the time. You can see from this image, the seven prominent warehouses of Castlefield by the 1840s, only two and a half of which are still with us today. The sudden appearance of warehouses here just outside the 19th century city limits betrays the fact that this whole area was just pleasant riverside fields. Sat beneath the sandstone bluff below the remains of the Roman fort and running down to the Medlock Irwell Convergence. Nice, but hardly ideal for a canal basin. This map is a reproduction of one I found in Cheatham's library, and while I don't have an exact date for when it was made, it seems to be from a period just after the completion of the Bridgewater Canal. Now you can see that the canal basin is pretty much devoid of buildings apart from the grocer's warehouse and some early keys at the end called Duke's Keys. You can see the height of the land and the steep banks leading down to the river, especially where the Roman fort is. Now these streets are only intended streets, meaning they weren't yet built, and many of them never were, replaced instead by large warehouses and mills. To create this unique canal hub, Brindley had to divert the River Medlock underground, from Chester Road to what would become Potato Wharf. This was where his massive weir comes in. And this is another uh, engineering masterpiece of James Brindley. And this is where the Bridgewater Canal terminated in Castlefields, just down there. And this behind me is the, the Giant's Basin. And it was a, a huge clover leaf shape. Um, it's been reduced to just one at the moment, but this is where the excess water from the canal spilled over, if there was any, and we went down through that tunnel if you can see that down there, into the River Medlock. Now the River Medlock um, ran into Castlefield Basin, but most of the water from the river was diverted underground, um, under here, and pops out just over there. And the whole water system around here was completely re-engineered by Brindley. Um, it's just um, a touch of genius. More significantly perhaps, the connection between the Rochdale and Bridgewater canals meant that there was now an unbroken line of passage from the North Sea to the Irish Sea. Very quickly after its completion, Castlefield Basin was the hub for more than just coal. Arriving was also vast quantities of timber, slate, stone, corn and other materials that the booming city was hungry for. The canals brought prosperity wherever they went. Worsley became a tourist attraction, possibly even attracting spies. German engineer Johann Haugru wrote a detailed account of the Bridgewater in 1780, illustrating it with diagrams and maps. Yet the vast canal system remained separate to the River Irwell until two competing ideas came along with the aim of connecting them. The first was a tiny branch canal off the Bridgewater that met the Irwell near its confluence with the Medlock. The second was an attempt to avoid the tolls of the Bridgewater and join the Irwell further upstream. And so, in 1839, the small branch between the Rochdale Canal and the River Irwell was cut called the Manchester and Salford Junction Canal. And there are still traces of it around today, though for the most part, it's disappeared. This is the lock on the Irwell, and it passed beneath the dark, crowded streets of the city to meet the Rochdale Canal. Much of it is still intact here and there, mostly out of sight. See, this is quite interesting actually because this is um, was a major lock. We're in the city centre, we're just off the River Irwell. That over there used to be Granada Studios. I mean, you can see they're developing the hell out of it now. It's all the banging and clanging going on. Um, but this isn't some arse end of the city, this isn't some forgotten about city. But yeah, look at the lock. It's completely forgotten about, it's overgrown, um, it's rotting away, it's full of algae and all sorts of other plant life. 
but I do like it. I like it like this. It's like stepping back in time a little bit. Not in a, a patronising way, but it's, it's the nitty gritty of what Manchester was like just 20, 30 years ago. And there it is, the other end. Um, and if I follow this, the Rochdale Canal, all the way down that way, I pop out back at the Castlefield Basin, which seems like as good a place as any to finish this video. So by the beginning of the 19th century, the canals were the veins in which Manchester's blood flowed, but something new, fast and efficient was about to come along. A new and exciting age in the Industrial Revolution. And it literally happened first here, not just in Manchester, but in Castlefield. So in 1830, the world's first intercity railway line opened between Manchester and Liverpool. Um, signalling the start of a new and exciting age in the Industrial Revolution. But sadly, it did mean one thing, that this, the canals, was old news. But remember, without the canals, none of this would have happened, and especially not in Manchester. <laughs> 